projects around the early phase of COVID-19 crisis. But it was the tragic loss of two young women lawyers who it was said had taken their lives during the pandemic that had a lasting impact and highlighted the need for a platform to address specific issues that concern women lawyers within the fraternity. The WhatsApp group thus took shape of a forum and is now a platform for robust interactions on wide range of issues concerning protection of civil liberties and constitutional and democratic rights. The forum now actively works towards creating a network and general visibility for women lawyers. It functions basis selective decision making and uh, decision making and in principle we avoid any kind of a vertical hierarchy. The forum regularly organizes coffee chat sessions to discuss thought provoking subjects of contemporary relevance and importance. We organize mentorship sessions for our young friends of the bar. We undertake donation drives to help the marginalized sections of the society. And we have also organized runs and other activities to foster mental and physical health for women lawyers. In fact, we recently started film screenings also where all of us participate and I think it's one event that we really look forward to all of us. <laughs> Speaking from my personal experience, I think the greatest virtue of this group is the assurance that, that health is just a message away. So there have been occasions when in a busy day we just send one WhatsApp message whether it is from rescuing an animal in distress to any need that a woman lawyer have, uh, may have or issues with respect to maybe something to do with a bar. But anything it is, we just put a message in the group and there is always response and I must say positive response and we have always seen things translating into results. So it's a very desire oriented group in that sense and I personally am very proud to be associated with this group. So, um, now, if I may request Ms. Shikha Uma Agarwal to introduce our esteemed speakers for today. Thank you, ma'am. And a very warm welcome to everyone here. It's my honor to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Our first speaker for the evening is Honorable Justice Kevin Chaturji. Uh, as we all know, Justice Rajiv Shadhar is currently as judge in the Delhi High Court. He was appointed as additional judge in the court in April 2008 and became permanent judge in October 2011. He holds rich experience in civil litigation, constitutional law, commercial litigation, corporate and tax laws. He has practiced in Supreme Court, High Court of Delhi, various other high courts, tax tribunals, tribunals dealing with insolvency, Deconstruction and Rehabilitation, and Company Law Matters as well. He chairs the Accessibility Committee in Delhi High Court, along with the Information and Technology Committee as well. Besides this, he has represented the Office of Controller and Auditor General of India from 2002 to 2003 as well. He keeps chairing various sessions uh, for the Delhi High Court Legal Services Committee, and recently he has chaired the session for its impaneled advocates, including pro bono advocates, jail visiting advocates, mediators, and urban councils. I would now request Meghna Ma'am to come forward and felicitate Justice Shepherd. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep it here? Yeah. Our next speaker for the evening is Swati Agrawal, who is Director with Increasing Diversity by in Increasing Swati. Access, which is also called IDEA. Swati, who is a lawyer by training, a communications strategist, content creator, and mental health and invisible disability advocate, is currently working as Director of Operations at IDEA Charitable Trust. She is managing the Student Volunteers Program in identifying and sensitizing underprivileged students to the power of law with diverse career options, alongside reigniting the accessibility program to make the field inclusive for persons with disabilities. She has previously worked as a banking and finance lawyer with ICICA Bank and Talwar Thakur and Associates in Mumbai. She has invisible illness and likes to work towards spreading awareness about invisible illness and disabilities. She affirms that one should never forget the good things in life just because of your health condition. Kajal ma'am, I would request you to come forward and felicitate Swati. Thank you, Swati. Can you give me 
Hello everyone, thank you so much for being with us today. We are in an honor to have you all. We are here to have something like a conversation. It's not going to be a formal event, formal event this time now. Uh, we are going to have a conversation around the issues, the concerns that lawyers with disabilities face. The issues and concerns that non-disabled lawyers face when they want to, for example, have them in their office. Maybe you all want, but you don't know how when. The issues concerning why we, we are not seen, why don't you see us in courts. So we hear it from the people who are dealing with these issues and then we look for solutions. That's what we are intending to do here. So, in order to do so, uh, I would first like to invite Mr. Shatran on to Mr. Shatran. Can I use this mic? I think this is a standing mic. Anyway, I sit and do it. No problem. Good evening, everyone. Uh, is it, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see a uh, whole lot of you over here. I've come to the bar room after a very, very long time. Is this now designated as the woman's uh, no, no, bar room? No. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, I'm not in the building committee. So <laughs> but it's time that uh, women lawyers had. Uh, yeah, uh, they get larger space. Uh, because they form a very important part of our uh, legal fraternity. So, I was uh, telling Sangeeta and her colleagues the other day when they had organized, which is, which, uh, they had organized uh, uh, a marathon, uh, rather a pinkathon, pinkathon that, uh, you know, you now uh, uh, should uh, spread your wings and form a more vital part of uh, the High Court Bar Association. So I can assure you now, seeing all of you over here, that uh, they have a, literally a run for their money, the Delhi High Court Bar Association. But coming back to coming back to uh, what we have congregated for, which is um, uh, you know uh, providing accessibility to those uh, who are differently able. Uh, I must compliment uh, the Women Lawyers uh, Forum that such, such an initiative has been taken. Uh, this only shows that, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of you, a whole bunch of you, which includes, uh, incidentally, not only women, but uh, men lawyers as well, because I see a lot of them over here, that they care for their colleagues who are, uh, let's say, differently able. I think this might, so I can just keep this here yeah. and use this. Uh, who are differently able. So, uh, as far as the accessibility committee is concerned, we have uh, taken up uh, several small steps, I would say. We've not sort of made that dramatic change that I would have liked to see. And most of that uh, has happened because of, uh, you know, persons like Rahul Bajaj, uh, with whom we have been interacting uh, off and on. Uh, I'm happy to, in fact, uh, inform you that only yesterday, uh, I called my secretary, uh, Delhi High Court Legal Services Committee, to include in the pro bono panel uh, lawyers like uh, Rahul Bajaj, Mr. Rongta, and others, so that they are available for uh, extending their uh, legal skills to not only people who are differently able, but also to able bodied litigants. And the the, the the purpose and the object is that at some stage they should feel that uh, they are part of the larger legal fraternity because if you don't make uh, these small changes they always feel that uh, you know they don't belong to this larger pool of lawyers that being said I I think the onus is on us, the ones who are, let's say, more fortunate 
that uh, we make those little uh, mindset changes as i call because you know half the time the barrier uh, is created by able bodied people uh, in a sense because of a lack of sensitivity to what they require uh, simple things like uh, you know giving them space at the bar when i say bar the bar means where uh, in the courtroom in fact uh, the other day i was thinking that we made a uh, made such a modern building uh, especially the complex where i sit but um, somehow when the building was being designed we haven't created a passage where a litigant such as my friend over here who's uh, you know uh, in a wheelchair he can navigate easily and come uh, to the bar and address arguments so these are those small things that uh, we somehow have missed and it almost seems that uh, you know having a ramp in a building is enough to give them accessibility which is not enough certainly so uh, rahul did suggest about rahul and his uh, our other his other colleague amar it suggests that you know they have difficulty uh, navigating uh, the cost list in the website so we have uh, screen readers we have uh, sort of installed uh, the software necessary uh, for enabling them to navigate uh, these uh, uh, websites where there is a whole host of information available but as i said going back to the point that i made uh, earlier is uh, the attitudinal barrier which uh, sort of uh, is located in each one of us where sometimes a person who is differently able is almost treated as if uh, you know he's he doesn't have the ability to think or he cannot communicate because you have all kinds of impediments there are some of uh, our friends over here who are visually impaired there are others uh, who have uh, speech imp- impediment uh, basically uh, the problem lies with us just because he can't speak doesn't mean he can't think so we have to find ways of enabling them to participate as lawyers uh you know fully as would a able order uh, able bodied lawyer do everything that we can do in that regard is um, almost a bounden duty of each one of us who is able bodied uh although i have come here and you know uh, so mic was handed and i had to make a speech i would rather hear my friends over here tell us what is it that we need to do than uh, you know me giving them a speech and telling them what we have done what we have done they already know what we need to do is uh, uh, what i would like to hear so that we can make those little changes so i would uh, whoever wants to take the mic first to tell us what are those barriers that you face every day whether it's infrastructure or otherwise and what are the accommodations that are available to you facilities that are available to you are they enough and if they are not enough uh, how do we upgrade them and uh, you know any other issue that you have so that uh, we can make those necessary changes so back to Uh, Sanchita, would you like to highlight? Because you have been uh, building as part of IDI, you have come across uh, so many students with disabilities, and then you come across because right now we are here sitting with so many lawyers who uh, we are looking at who may absorb these law students in future, who may want to, you know, when you send them for internships, what are the issues that they are facing? Uh, and how do we bridge it is something that then we can hear it from the the students themselves so if you can just say a few words on yeah. it and then uh sure uh, thank you. thank you sanchita and uh, it's <coughs> it's really great knowing rahul sanchita amar all of you because uh, i think i've been on both sides of this coin because uh, i developed my chronic pain and a uh, cognitive uh, issues and uh, much later in life so i know how to be on the side which we have we don't think about it on a day to day basis what about accessibility and that's because we haven't met in a people who have disabilities in our life 
And now as I see myself and I see my father who has a visual impairment. So I have been on both sides and while I'm working, I've learned about accessibility. So I'm not someone who was thinking about it from day one. I also learned about it from you all, from IDIA scholars and uh, from my experiences with time. So I think like uh, there are always uh, so we have we are we have actually worked on a workplace guidelines with some very easy steps that can be taken. I think it's important about diversity to understand. Uh, sorry about disability is to understand that it's a diverse community. So the needs uh, first is the type of disability. Of course, uh, there are uh, you know visual impairment, speech impairment, uh, using wheelchairs to. Uh, invisible disabilities and <coughs> there are disability people who are born with disability people who acquire disabilities later in life and there's intersection of other identities whether it is like gender and sexuality financial background and all which makes the needs of each person different so I think the best way to uh, if you're just starting out by taking your first intern is to just be familiar and to bridge the attitudinal and the hesitation we have in just asking what are your uh, needs or requirements. Like it's just easier to just ask instead of assuming that we'll know. And for practical steps, uh, I mean, there are like hundreds which I can code and um, like, for example, for me, uh, I would have loved to become a law professor, but I cannot write the exam because my hand does not allow me to write for that long. And there are crammed up places in school. So I can never write the exam to ever, uh, Teach. Right. So uh, now we have amongst us so many guests, lawyers and law students with disabilities. So I would like to just take their names and acknowledge their presence and then let you all participate in the discussion yourself. Uh, you can introduce yourself and when we have to be with you. So we, of course, have a Sarah Sunny and Rahul Bajaj, who are uh, my co moderators, and I won't begin with their disability here, that's important, right? So, Sarah is a very, very confident lawyer. Yesterday she mentioned a matter about herself when she didn't even know she was supposed to do all of that happen. She shared those experiences, but amidst all of these are those struggles that perhaps. Sarah, you would want to talk about that and then we can acknowledge that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, do you want to stand? Okay. So, I'm going to share my experience. Is that okay? All right. My name is Sarah Sali, I'm Kim Sarah Sali. I'm working as an assistant to such a guy. So I'm from Bangalore. My office is in Bangalore. Rama Krishna is here. Is my boss. He's here. Um, I'm I'm gonna share more about my experience as a deaf lawyer. Obviously, I face a lot of challenges inside the courtroom. The first point that I would like to share is when I enter the courtroom of the lower court, and I bring an interpreter. So even the watchman there would ask me, "Who is this? Who is this person? Who is this person?" And I have to inform that I have to work with an interpreter. But mostly we are kicked out. And along with the data, I'm kicked out. I'm a lawyer. I have my ID, right? But I'm always told that get out. So that's my first problem. Coming to the second problem. In high court, at the same time when I bring an interpreter, one time what happened is that uh, so the interpreter is instructing me everything in ISL. And the judge would ask me, huh, why do I look angry? What, what is this expression? And what are you both doing? So the judge gets uh, suspicious of what we are doing. So I have to again explain, sir, I'm deaf, um, and then we understand, obviously. 
but uh, the bench, uh, they also get a little, uh, and the clerk, so the clerk gets angry with me. Uh, and they ask me, like, why did you have to bring an interpreter up to the courtroom? And then I have to just repeat and repeat that I'm deaf and I need an interpreter. So that's, that's the second one. The third one that I would like to share here, long back. So one lawyer told me, then if I have to argue, I'll, uh, I have to argue with writing, written arguments. And I why? Why is that? I mean, you all are arguing uh, orally, you're allowed that, and I have my strength, right? I can argue using my interpreter in my earlier office. So in the earlier office. So even yesterday in the Supreme Court, in the morning, the interpreter was Manisha, who's here with us. She was there. And she was interpreting for me in, uh, and uh, and post lunch she had to leave so there had to be another interpreter who was available online virtually but judge just said what is happening why is this laptop just switch it off what is the need and then I had to explain uh, that I need this, I need yeah. this accessibility. So this, this has been my experience, it's an everyday struggle. Um, what is my opinion? Uh, what do I really need? I think why do I need permission to bring my interpreter every time? Can we have something like all you are hearing uh, lawyers? You know, you, you, hear, you can access the other cases, you understand everything, but that uh, that is that is not available to me. So I have to depend on the interpreter. So I want everybody to understand that accessibility is primary need. Without the interpreter, how do I function? Yeah, so they, they're there for me. Yes, that's it. Thank you. The issues that I want to highlight here that uh, Working with her has made me realize for which I have been talking a lot these days. One is uh, non-availability of uh, uh, interpreters who can find uh, legal terms. We have it in, in, uh, in Delhi, of course. The panel is really good. So, really good. We are very proud to have such a panel in Delhi. But then they are again very few. If they are in Saket court, for example, Manisha had to be in Saket court in second half. So then I had to get someone from Bangalore, Coimbatore in fact, because we only have five interpreters who can possibly interpret legal terms. So therefore, what can be done? Of course, we can say it's government's job. We can say it's uh, uh, universities want to start a course. How do we go about it so that even lawyers, law students may want to learn sign language or wherever these sign language courses are being taught, maybe they can have an elective. I'm just throwing an idea here to see how that turns out. We have Narayanan sir here. Narayanan sir is clapping. Um, Narayanan sir is uh, the president of National Association of Deaf. So perhaps he can uh, think about it a little and do something because uh, right now we only think that oh it's just one deaf lawyer but we'll only have one deaf lawyer if this challenge continues that's the concern we had Saudamini earlier same challenge we have Sarah same challenge she has been in the profession for three years but we got to know about her when when I got an interpreter for her in Supreme Court why was it not happening why was such a Decent law firm where she was working earlier would make her sit in, in office. Right? So this is the problem. Even when people want to hire, do they really want to improve? Yeah. So I would like to just add one thing uh, to what is it? Three years. So I used to just write everything for argument and uh, it was it was always like you know only for something the requesting for postponement. So I could not argue because there were always other lawyers arguing and the opportunity. So yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right, Sanjana. The other issue she is facing now, during her student life, she was only repeating and understanding what was being taught. 
So for example, habeas corpus, when he would have heard for the first time, it would, was a new term. Now for her to live, read and understand what, what habeas corpus, what that, what that word is, she has studied law in this manner. Now when she is an interpreter, she goes to court, she understands everything that's happening. <coughs> She's amazing. Her drafting skills are amazing. Now the thing is, I know if she goes to regularly to court, observes proceedings, she learn a lot. So now what can we do for that? Of course, she doesn't practice here. She's not registered here. But of course, uh, she works in, in, uh, with my uh, colleague in Bangalore. She is as much my colleague. So what can we do to support her in observing court proceedings? Now, when we enter court and, and in the matter is going on, we get to hear it. We have that privilege to observe. Uh, do we, are we asked to close our ears? Yesterday, that's what was bothering me. Why should that question be even asked? That why should an interpreter be there for other proceedings? Now, it of course implies cost. And therefore, there is a constraint that I face on a daily basis if there can be some support from the committee with regard to maybe once a week, twice a week, thrice a week, whatever can be done for a couple of hours where she can observe Delhi High Court proceedings. She has just now yesterday observed and she said she really enjoyed it. And Delhi High Court is one of the best courts to learn. So I, this is one of the concerns that I would like to point out. And now let me kind of come to our guests before we give you the floor, Rahul. So we have uh, with us, of course, we have you, sir, Arvind Rao. He has been practicing since uh, last one and a half years. And uh, of course, he's, he's, uh, he's someone who is, you haven't seen him in court, right? So we'll ask him why we haven't seen him in court, what are the challenges he faces from his personal experience. Before that, can you please ask someone to please facilitate and hand it to Sarah? Of course, please. Speaking so beautifully. That's for you. Thank 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 you.
uh, I feel uh, kind of division of the recommendation can help everywhere, can be a place where we can point out that you know, these are the things so that we have that comfort of going for the other and not thinking that they are going to be thinking this or they are going to be thinking I am not interested or I am not a good speaker and this is because I am speaking so deeply. No. I'm also going to use this as an excuse to stretch my legs because they're going to grants. So, uh, so, so this thing about patience um, and attitude is something I feel like, you know, if you're living with a disability, although our experiences are different, whether it's visible or invisible, you are always an advocate because you have to keep advocating for yourself at every stretch. So, for example, uh, my brain fog is I cannot remember names, like, you know, like, for example, I had to uh, think so much about Sanchita's name today morning and we've been chatting so much. So, it's, uh, and I can't remember words. So, I think, uh, I think this patience is very difficult and I understand I've been in quotes, uh, I understand how rushed it is, but this is an important attitude to change. For example, two of our scholars who were in Calcutta High Court, uh, there is no braille signage anywhere and there are separate buildings, okay, and Delhi High Court, for example, is also very big. So it's very difficult uh, for someone with visual impairment, even after being shown the code around the layout for one or two days, to find specific code room. And if they stop and ask someone for directions, there was nobody there to give them. So, so it, they just couldn't reach the quote on time. So I just wanted to say that things like, you know, uh, small things like uh, proper signage, uh, tactile floating, or any way that information can, which can be disseminated easily. For example, I was already tired by the time I entered this room because the procedure of getting passed and all, although it was me, must simplified by you guys, but if I didn't just come here on my own. Uh, I wouldn't know the procedure. One person will send it to another. These things should be easily listed and information available in order uh, for places to be accessible. It's true for every place. Uh, airports, port rooms, every place. Now can we have a test? Actually, I have a question. Can we have a test? Can we have a Good evening, uh, everyone. This is Abhishek from National Army Club. I am in Korea. I am in Korea. I hope to express my gratitude for being part of this family. Um, thanks for uh, participating, participating in this uh, program. Uh, most of the people's names I don't know. But, uh, and thank you to each one who are participating in this event. I would like to share uh, two problems, two issues uh, in my life, what happened. I came from Kodushan village, it's a part of Telangana state, Uttarabha district. And uh, I have lost my father uh, at the age of uh, seven years old. In 2000. Nine years in 2007. And being a basic uh, community, I have faced uh, past discrimination. And being a visual impaired person, I face even disability, uh, discrimination. And when I became visually impaired, and all my friends left me alone, I became visually impaired in 2014. In 2013, and uh, that time I realized a uh, lot of things. I went to Lehma uh, School for the time in Hyderabad. Dr. Hyderabad was the uh, founder of Lehma School, and uh, I, I, I passed the standard days, and the IDA organization gave me an opportunity to pursue in law. And uh, whenever I go for internship, most of the time people visit me very uh, very much and very 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 concerned. When I apply for the PG hotels, and they are not willing to support me most of the time. So this is uh, most of the time I am facing. This is one of the big problem, big, big problem I am facing. And uh, I hope I don't have uh, four house. 
I don't have any washroom facilities. So whenever I want to go to India, most of the villages people go washroom for the uh, outside. Whenever I want to go to a military for a union, and I have to ask my uh, family support. And they don't want to understand sometimes, you know, they, they sometimes you know, shout at me. And even most of the time I'm not comfortable, you know, disclosing, you know, I'm uh, getting, you know, remaining, you know, I want to go with him. Most of the time I'm not comfortable. But if I help them, they depend on people. And uh, the big visual effect uh, student is what I realize, and we don't have freedom to express our uh, opinion. And whenever you share your opinion, and uh, if you if you the right argument, and people try to exclude you because they don't want to uh, see you as a achiever, as a you know developing student. And they try to put you always down. This is, uh, I have seen in my personal, personal life of being a law student. And uh, whenever they should I mean, was becoming alone. And this is uh, what is happening for me, it's a difficult to form my own opinion. It means almost my freedom of speech is gone. And uh, there are a lot of issues, but uh, I don't think so I have sufficient time here. I hope recently uh, the story of my life is understood I have uh, shared with uh, on the campus with a few professors and I would like to share also this event uh, with uh, Sanjita Mahan as well and uh, with uh, Scotty Mahan as well. And we uh, would like to participate in uh, political legislation. We want to participate, we want to participate in that also. I have that dream to perceive, but uh, in India, uh, most of the time people are excluding us, but we would like to raise our own voice and if we get opportunity in legislature and parliament. I feel that is the biggest achievement in India. Uh, I hope Rahul Uttara and Surya uh, fight over this and uh, I support my contribution for good cause, always 100% there. And now the judge, taught me uh, legal, uh, uh, legal, uh, uh, yeah, uh, research, yeah. So I would like to share here uh, other problems, but I don't think so I have sufficient time. Uh, thanks, Judge, um, this is my pain. Uh, I have a lot of pain in my heart. But I'm not able to explain here with this short of time. But uh, this is a conflict where uh, I got a opportunity and I'm pursuing that. Thank you to Ambedkar. And uh, he said in one quote, educate, agitate, and analyze. Right now I'm in the process of educating myself. But uh, one day this country is going to see definitely uh, good problem. is going to contribute. Um, my entire So, uh, one thing that came out of what Amishik uh, said was uh, that she was trying to say was uh, the aspect of exclusion. Now, we perhaps don't deliberately exclude.
social problems happen. Like I face, and I know when people do talk about it, but uh, we, we think, and I, I really face with my boss, and thankfully, because Shadan for us, Mrs. Salman, who she has some of the best practices to talk about, we have to apply her in the office to sit and work for three, four years. I could sit on a chair and fall down. I had difficulty in being posture. So that was possible, that was being possible without any question. And despite those beliefs that they had. So, therefore, constant, constantly we need to be able to, for example, even in manual office, I wish to share later on perhaps, when we have the how we would keep interacting with our families and keep telling them this ought to be and this not ought to be and never take inclusion for granted. If you don't find people with this around, it means there's something wrong with you. Uh, if you can say a few words about yourself and then talk about your business, Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to all of you. My name, you all know, Shikha Mahadhan, right? Quickly, uh, you can often ask why you have to meet Shikha and Yuma. So Shikha is my name, Yuma is my mother's name, and I am very proudly to add you in the name of Yuma. So hence, Shikha Mahalo. Coming to the disability and the issues, yes. Issues we all have. I think all humans sometimes in the moment have issues. Able bodied people with disabilities and everything. So why is it when people with disabilities say that we have issues with cancer and subjectivity? Whenever we ask for anything with respect to our specific disabilities, cancer and special. Which is not special. We all have our accommodations that we ask for. When we go for accommodations, we ask for certain reasonable accommodations that are there. So we definitely like also need certain accommodations which are not special in nature but something very general. So just like if you have to go, for example, to first floor and then we do stairs to the floor, I need a ramp or a little bit, which is very normal. So there is no need to think that there is something special about it or there is something very different than I'm asking for. Similarly, handmaids or accessible washrooms, restrooms, any place which is accessible for a person who is using a wheelchair and it also has spine cord problem called stoliosis. That makes me a little, it makes it a little difficult for me to sit for very long hours during the day. So if I'm asking for breaks in between, if I'm asking for flexible hours to work in between, it's not difficult because we are living in a digital era. So when digitalization is possible, when it's a virtual conference, everything is possible, virtual hearing is possible. So if I can handle that virtually, I think if I can think, I can read, I can write, I can interpret, I can talk, that makes me a lot of subject to start my own practice. But I have been dissipated number of times when I announced that I want to venture into the legal profession, I have been dissipated by many lawyers as well that this is not the profession for you. It is Sometimes you have to rush to the courtroom, which you can't because you just roll on a wheelchair. Rolling on a wheelchair life has been a roller coaster ride for me, and I'm sure it is the same for each one of us here. So let's just accept that we all are individuals. What I'm asking for is a reasonable accommodation which will only help me and people like me come forward irrespective of the profession they want to pursue, and that should not become a hindrance in living a life which is independent and sustainable. Uh, yes, I think it is doable and not something which can happen. Thank you.
how do we ensure greater visibility for lawyers with disabilities in the courts, such that they're able to uh, appear regularly and learn the vocabulary, fundamental vocabulary of litigation and make a profile for themselves. A few sub issues within with that arise are one. You know, litigation is a profession with high entry barriers and especially so for persons with disabilities because it is a vicious cycle for everyone that like the more you appear, the more cases you get and because you don't appear, you don't get cases so it's it kind of a self reinforcing cycle for many people but especially so for persons with disabilities. Second is, you know, and this has been covered, the reason is for the lack of visibility, the, the feeling uh, that they will not be able to perform, concerns about the time it will take for them to provide the requisite information to the senior or the judge when they ask for it. And of course, the hydration environment that is really obtained in litigation. And the third aspect is, you know, the lawyer getting paid in court is the lawyer who only do disability rights cases. Now, a few solutions that I would like to quickly propose and we can discuss this. So, one, uh, uh, my mother said, I spoke about induction into panels. I think that's a very good idea. As, I mean, uh, uh, my of course, make sure you don't do it in a tokenistic manner, which obviously we are not. But uh, sort of making sure that we give people the opportunity to, you know, get that, get that exposure and, and really make the name for themselves through that. Secondly, of course, sensitizing the bar and the bench, which, which, which goes without saying. And third is that ensuring that, uh, that there's a proactive effort to ensure that such lawyers have a broader spread of work, right, not just disability, right. Then, second aspect is with respect to participating effectively in court rooms, right, getting reasonable accommodations in hearing. So one issue that arises here, which people have spoken about, is balancing efficiency with reasonable accommodation. Because it's hot, and to an extent, I would concede that things do take a little longer with whatever visibility you have. You may not be able to deliver immediately. So, how do we make reasonable accommodation practical, right? Um, especially given the cutthroat competition that litigation is. Um, and you know, a lot of you obviously have the sentiment that you know we want to help such people, etc. But then, how do we translate that into rights-based advocacy or rights-based support for them? Uh, you know, in our profession, people have no patience level that everyone has spoken. Uh, but the other connected issue with that is that if you ask for reasonable accommodation, it may be seen that you know, the matter will get knocked off for three months, four months. So then the client will suffer. So how do we ensure that we sensitize our judges in this direction? Uh, and especially for this category of lawyers. So potential solutions that I have is, of course, sensitization goes without saying. Tech solutions we really need to scale up. So, for instance, you know, ensuring that um, uh, we make our offerings disabled and legal databases. So, one thing which I would think we should do is to uh, liaise with the makers of SCC Mangavatra and others. And with SCC, I haven't had the most pleasant experience, but I won't go into that now. Uh, you know, to ensure that they make their platforms accessible. Of course, I know the e-community is working on this, but the fact of the matter is private platforms are still widely used, so we still, should still try to make them accessible. Uh, not doing reasonable accommodation as tardiness, right? And making competent human support available to such persons, like for instance, younger lawyers or law students who can deal stuff for blind lawyers in the court who may not be able to access content. The, Third point is, you know, how do we make pleadings and lectures accessible? Because that's a big issue for uh, argumentation effectively. Pleadings are still often filed without OCRing them. Uh, you know, there are a lot of issues with Adobe Acrobat Pro from the perspective of visually impaired people. It is a software that is still used for compiling PDFs. I won't go into the specific issues for lack of time. Cited support is indispensable for reading a lot of documents, even if you have them in OCR, because still there will be screen on pictures, handle textures in pictures and so on. And screen readers are also not designed to handle the case load of litigation work given how voluminous the files sometimes are. Uh, <coughs> solutions. Number one, I think having practical direction to ensure that dealing with such matters are filed in an accessible form and uh, my own. Justice Shankar and us, we had a detailed discussion on this and I believe the registry is working on this now. Secondly, getting into a dialogue with the platform that control access to, for example, uh, Adobe and you know, the databases. 
uh, the nexus, nexus of the world. So I have to ensure that legal commentaries are made accessible. And also having a system in the court library so that you can ask for accessible copies of books in the library, you can scan them and make them available. Finally, you know, just on reasonable accommodation, a couple of other points. Uh, in this long adjournment point, I've already mentioned, and then may arise the thing that oh, well, why bother? Right? Because like, ultimately, you have a client sitting on your head, you need to deliver the goods, and if you think somebody is going to take longer, it can create some amount of agitation and inhibition. So we need to be more open-minded about this and, uh, and and really walk the talk. So you know, uh, not just like be able to stick our neck out there and say, for example, if you are in a law firm, if you are in an accessible data room, and if you have to do due diligence for which you need to access that, the law firm has to have the courage to write to the provider saying that you make it accessible. But you know, it shouldn't be that they feel that oh look. If you were to do this, we will lose the time. So some amount of courage has to be there with appropriate state support and uh, support from the courts. There are just a few thoughts. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to whoever wants to take it ahead from there. Uh -huh. I had a question. Uh, so, I, uh, other than legal databases, currently, what are the office programs like Citrix and? This is for the end Oh, good, sorry. No, I think let, let her go. Uh, yeah, I just want to know what are the similar software currently being used in High Court, uh, other than the legal databases for yeah for in-house operations. Yeah. Uh, does anyone know in terms of like, like what do you mean by court staff with disability? It, no, what I mean is has there been accessibility audit done of the so different software and platforms being used? Uh, uh, after the last discussion that we had, yes. we have. Uh, Already, the yeah, the jaws. Screen we have. Oh, yeah, screen readers we have. Yeah, so, can I just explain this? Uh, do we have it? Upper limit, uh, something that was the people who are sitting here, if you want to have tea also, at some stage, the conversation can be carried outside. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. So, I, I know all of you must be uh, kind of uh, getting ready to have your respective conferences. So, you know, th this is a conversation which has started and I hope it uh, sort of continues because the idea is unless, as one of the speakers just said, unless you are exposed to what they go through on a daily basis, you will not be, uh, let's say, uh, sensitive to their needs. Simple things like providing documents which are OCR compliant, if you are, uh, you know, you are able body but your colleague is uh, visually impaired or has any other legal uh, any, any other, other disability, you need to make that accommodation. That is one. The other point that comes to quite clearly is that uh, apart from the bar, the bench needs to be sensitive. And uh, next time around, we'll have uh, more judges over here because uh, when they hear their uh, not stories, their experiences, because law is about life experiences. And when they hear what their life experiences are, they would then perhaps uh, navigate them better. Then, as uh, Sunny said, that uh, you know, the judge said, uh, not intentionally, obviously, that you know, why are you angry? Why do you need X, Y, Z device to uh, navigate a hearing? So these are uh, conversations that all of us we you know sort of we need to have it in small and bigger groups. Uh, as far as uh, certain facilities are concerned, as I told you, we've already taken some steps and uh, uh, it's not a pyrrhic exercise that we did because when we had this discussion with uh, Rahul Uli last evening, I uh, told him that I want to do these two things and I'm re-emphasizing as that we want to put you on the panel where you will advise not only uh, people who have uh, you know disabilities but those who don't have disabilities. The only challenge will be when a litigant comes for legal aid and he sees a lawyer such as Rahul, he doesn't know his ability. He is perhaps, according to me, uh, one of those who is better than uh, some of the so-called able-bodied uh, uh, lawyers. In fact, he's, I have appointed him as a case in one of my matters and that matter is coming up in the uh, Because I didn't um, uh, feel that I needed an able-bodied lawyer to help me out, but I needed someone like Rahul because the matter had certain uh, aspects concerning um, a disabled person. So who best? Uh, 
uh, but uh, someone, someone like Rahul who's had the experience. One, two, other steps, steps like uh, we intend putting in the cause list, list. Like, like we, we have, have categories, categories. a category yeah. for uh, you know uh, persons with disability. Now we can have those categories. I told Rahul that this is a this is a challenge. Uh, in the past, we've had categories for senior citizens, but you know how how pressed uh, quarters for time. So my request to them also is that you know it's not about giving you something out of pity. You need to be at par. What I want, or what all of us want for you, is to be equal to the ones who are. Uh, you know, who are able bodied because that is, that's what you are looking for. And that this is your legal right. And the sooner we understand that, the better it is. So therefore, simple things, small steps we've taken. We've, uh, we, we have a car parking now, which uh, where there is a slot, at least in the Delhi High Court, uh, for uh, PWDs. Uh, we have screen readers. We have bought uh, a particular software. Rahul and I have been in discussion with my team. Jaws so that uh, they're able to navigate the website, the cause list. They are on panels, and uh, I don't want them to be only on pro bono panels because I want them to earn. One of the one of the problems here is that uh, they don't get to start with enough uh, work, and when people see them performing in legal aid matters, I'm sure some litigant will come up and uh, engage them in private matters. And it is not as if uh, people uh, who have had disability in our profession have not risen to the top. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Gupto in West Bengal was an advocate general for that state for yeah Narayan for a for a for a, for a very long time. Gupto uh, as it's, it's not Gupta, Gupto. So it is not as if uh, we won't see uh, some of them rising to the top of the profession. And uh, so therefore, all I request uh, members of the bar to do is when you see your colleague who is uh, having these kind of issues to make that accommodation both mentally and otherwise and bring those aspects to the notice of the judge because in our daily routine, we sometimes, you know, overlook it. We don't think it, it matters. It does matter. Mm. Yeah, if you have, uh, you know, if you open up your hearts, uh, you, uh, you know, refer work to them, like you refer it to other colleagues, exactly. which will help them to grow. So there is one concern that is coming from my junior colleagues with disabilities and it has crossed my mind several times and I am sure all of you would have experienced the uncertainty in the profession. Right, so it's a common doubt we tend to have. It's, it's of course of a greater magnitude for us because we also have to have expenses that you all don't have. We have concerns. I, I didn't know if I would be standing at, at the age of 40. So I wanted to earn enough. So should I go for XYZ job, etc. to get that much of money or should I do what I'm passionate about? Was the question. So such questions, all these my colleagues have right now that may not have come in as many words. I would like one of you, a non-disabled lawyer, senior lawyer, to, to talk a little bit about whether you had those doubts and how you dealt with it because for us networking definitely has been an issue. You won't see a socializing because nobody knows. Right? Uh, you will say we don't talk, I will, I will say you don't talk. Right? That's the kind that's the exclusion work and that's where we need to work on. But what what were your concerns and how did you deal with it so that we can also then relate to and say, oh this is exactly what we are also doing. Yeah, sure. Who wants to go ahead? Malika, you want to? One last input you can have and maybe then Yeah, we have to close this. So I'll very quickly say this that I heard about all the concerns here about accessibility, about uh, technology being available. And I know that our judges, our bench, uh, the entire system is trying to take care of that. But I think as a bar, it's our responsibility to include them in work and not just pro bono work, not just work involving uh, disability, but active work, civil law, criminal law, commercial law. I think that is our responsibility 
And today I am really thankful because our eyes have opened to this. And uh, also one other thing that you talked about, all the young people go through this. But I think once we have crossed that bridge and we are wherever we are, we are able to then include more people. I think we have to make an endeavor towards that. And this is now something that I say we should start as responsible lawyers that we should involve more and more people here with our work, we should refer work, we should get them involved in active matters, we should also help them with the interpreters and all this concern. I think it is not difficult to get an associated pass made. If that pass is there, let's say for the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, you have a proximity card associated with the person, with the lawyer, it will not be that difficult. In the morning, if the courtmaster is informed, the judges will come to know about the issues and that can be dealt with them. Time can be made for them. There can be a special slot and all these concerns can be taken care of. And I think the bar can actually step forward and help all of you with this. That's all. Yes, I just and like um, I've heard really good things about the video. I've heard really mm -hmm. good things about the video. First of all, I would like to thank Uh, 
uh, anti bar fantastic uh, uh, members, but and you are also com committee or some wherever you find place for us because uh, considering the disability uh, need of, of every disability is different. So that is my uh, thank you very much. last point because I see that a lot of suggestions are coming so this is I'm sure the first of many conversations but if you have any suggestions you can reach out to Mr. Ashok Kumar who is the nodal officer of the Delhi Airport Accessibility Committee the details are on the website so whichever suggestions come I'm sure we place it before the committee and it can be taken up in a streamlined fashion everything which has been discussed today I have taken note of <coughs> discuss with Lordship and other later on and see what test will be done. But going forward also this meeting is an exist for you to So uh, Rahul, you can tell them about the WhatsApp group that we have. Yes. So, uh, we have a WhatsApp group. Yes. Which I am uh, there on the WhatsApp group. So whenever things get stuck, uh, you know, yeah. uh, it gets escalated to me. Yeah. And uh, you know, things get resolved. So Mr. Ashok Kumar is also there. What cannot get resolved then it comes to me. So. Some of you who are there, you can join the WhatsApp group and we can uh, carry this story forward. Uh, there were some wonderful suggestions. In fact, uh, the last speaker made some very, very relevant uh, suggestions which can be immediately implemented. So let's see what we can do as fast as we can. But uh, yeah, uh, some things are above my pay rate, but those which are, I will get them done. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. 
started with the cafe. We needed to find one small common denominator that connected everyone and what better than food. To do that, with food as a common denominator, we started to create cafes, which were completely matched by people with physical, intellectual, and psychiatric disabilities. And they were the change makers who would make the world around them as they would like to see it, a more inclusive world. If you see this picture here, this girl sitting in this wheelchair, she was a first employee who gave crawling in from an interview because at that point in time she got her parents to not afford the wheelchair. This, this was our first cafe was inside a dilapidated wheelchair in a small town called Pogi in Peranta. Then, you know, there was just a table and everything in the cafe was done with community, community support. People like you all supported us to build the cafe. And when this girl came to us, her hands used to turn like this. Anything that she had in her hand fell. With months and months of training, today, this girl sitting on a wheelchair that she bought with her own money, manages to care of people with disabilities. She can handle the process of cafe. She can handle the process of cafe. I think we today have hundreds of such cafes across the 40 plus multi cafes that we have. And together, we have served over 11 million meals and beverages. Perceptions about the cause of disability and inclusion with every couple of people so we spoke about sensitization. This is sensitization happening every single time that a meal is served. Every time a meal is served. This girl here in the middle, his name is Herampa. When he came to us, he did not know the concept of prevention or even brushing his teeth. We talk about running cafes with the highest level of safety, hygiene, standards. He was told for his entire life that. He will never be able to do anything. He will never be able to get a job. He will never have a life. And something magical happened. He got a job. He is today the team lead. If you look at that box that Aaron had now, he is the team lead for our cafe at the Bangalore International Airport. But there was another very painful thing that was told him that he will never find love. Now, love is so, so basic. Everybody needs love, right? And then magic happened. <laughs> he found the love of his life, Rupa, at a witty cafe, and they fell in love, and they were married. So many, so many love stories at our little witty cafes. And how, how did all of this happen for us? You know, I spoke about the community support, I spoke, spoke about partnerships. Partnerships are the most, most important thing, they're the most powerful thing. And here we have like such a wonderful partnership happening with, yeah, with the Hindu Rani Foundation. So, I think, you know, everyone here is so passionate about inclusion because you all are serving justice to the world. And these two women really exemplify it for us. And this entire partnership with the Gurani Foundation has created history. How? Through Minji Kathy at the Supreme Court of India. I hope you are the president of the country, Shivati Rampi Muni, visited our cafe at uh, the Supreme Court. The cafe itself was nominated by the Chief Justice and his companion, companion Judge. Uh, just uh, this is the airport. Uh, we have cafes at the Lucknow International Airport, at the Bombay International Airport. We have it in colleges, in hospitals, uh, in corporates, in public spaces. And we are also starting very soon at the Rashtra Bhutan. So, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's been a little bit of recognition that we received. Uh, from the United Nations, from the Commonwealth, from folks that we have in 30 and so on. But the biggest recognition is your support. And today we have team that we have served, uh, our wonderful uh, team of adults with disabilities are here. Come to her. And I love for Jagan to say a few words.
I would love to have it for this year.